nerds and nerd followers. Uh, yeah, that's me. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about corruption, vice, sex, and all the fun things that uh, make Emeryville a great place to work and live. Let's get started. The Rotten City. When Emeryville was the center of corruption and vice in the Pacific Coast, asterisk, we still are, you just don't know that. Okay. Joseph Emery. Joseph Emery, born in New Hampshire. Moved to California in uh, 1850. He was a stone cutter. He's responsible for building the U.S. Mint in San Francisco. He also built the San Francisco Jail. He had a quarry on Yerba Buena Island. He lived in San Francisco for a while. He kind of got bored, like the most of us did, going to San Francisco all the time. So he said, you know, I'm going to move to the East Bay. He moved to the East Bay. He bought a plot of land called the Joseph S. Emery Tract in 1859. And in 1859, he relocated to Emeryville. It's named after him. So a little bit about Emeryville how Emeryville was created and why it was always, from day one, the place where vice was first. You've got to have a background. So Emeryville has two parts to it. On the left is the north part, on the right is, the right is, I'm going to know. On the right is the south part. On the left is Butchertown. Butchertown was an area that was all stockyards, it was slaughterhouses. It was basically a place where you could find meat and entrails on the streets. Yeah. On the south side of Emeryville was the gambling component. It's the racetrack. It's called the Oakland Trotting, uh, Trotting Club. And they had a one mile racetrack that was located between Stanford Street and Park Avenue. And it had the biggest gambling outfit on the West Coast. Horse racing took place there. And times were good in Emeryville. Lots of bars on San Pablo. Only about 250, 300 residents. Joseph Emery was quite happy. He built Park Avenue, a handful of streets along Park Avenue. If you've ever been to Emeryville and you see Park Avenue where Town Hall is, all those side streets that go along it are named after all his children. Uh -huh. True. His house was located at the corner of uh, Pablo, uh, San Pablo and uh, Park Avenue, where the IHOP is located. I'm sure he'd be very happy to know that his mansion has been replaced by an IHOP. Uh -huh. um, but that's the way it is. And at the far end of uh, Park Avenue, he had Town Hall and a hotel. So, how did Emeryville get created? Well, from the very first suggestion of its existence, Emeryville was always destined to be a city for vice and corruption. Why? Well, because it had a couple neighbors. It was part of Oakland Township in the late 1800s. Oakland had become a city. It was growing expansively, extensively. Uh, Berkeley had become a town, and there was this little cluster of districts, Emeryville District, Golden Gate District, and then Temescal District. And the people who lived in those other nice, fine districts were wealthy and moral and Christian and didn't like people in Emeryville. Because we gambled and we had prostitution and we had bars and saloons and people did all the things you're not supposed to do. So they decided, hmm, how are we going to avoid being annexed by Oakland? Oakland had just annexed what's now West Oakland. How are we going to prevent that? And how are we going to get rid of these assholes in Emeryville who are doing all this vice and corruption? I have an idea. Let's actually form our own town. So the people in Temescal signed a petition in 1896 and said, we're going to actually create a city. And it's going to be made of the Emeryville and the Temescal district. Well, as you might imagine, the people who own the horse race track were not stupid people. They had a lot of money. And they said, no, oh, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. Why? Because, okay, we have a couple hundred people, they have a couple thousand people. As soon as we are merged with them into a town, they're going to abolish gambling and horse racing. Bad idea. Meanwhile, the people who lived in the Golden Gate District were like, oh, we cannot stand the smell of foul meat and fucking entrails on the goddamn streets of Everyville. We need to get rid of these fucking assholes. So they conspired to do this petition to get rid of Emeryville by adopting it into a city. And so the slaughterhouse people and the people who owned the racetrack got together in the middle of 19, 1896. Sorry, it could have been 1986 if you've been to our town. But in 1896, they got together and they said, we're going to run our own petition. We're going to make our own city, and it's only going to be the Emeryville district. And so they did, and they won Joseph Emery's heart. He had originally signed the other petition. They won him over. And on December 2nd, 1896, after a campaign of mudslinging with people in Temescal said, well, if you allow the city of Emeryville to be, become a real city, it will forever be a scourge on the East Bay. It will be a, 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 no, a ne'er-do-well location. It will be a place where the, the type of people who hang out by racetracks will have a place to stay. That's literally the kind of shit that people said about Emeryville. And you know what? Out of a vote of 150 to 27, Emeryville became a town, December 2nd, 1896. And, not to be said too loudly, uh, the folks who owned the racetrack had all of their employees who were building the racetrack uh, register as Emeryville residents before they did. So, anyways, moving on. There, oh, no, no, you're not to you yet. 
That's the Emeryville, that was the uh, Emeryville uh, Oakland Trotting Park, which as soon as Emeryville became a city, by the way, it changed its name to the California Jockey Club, because as we say in Emeryville, we're not Oakland. <laughs> no offense. But we're not Oakland. So, Emeryville begins. And uh, up here you see, uh, up here you see uh, the, the horse racing track, and a very popular place. Made a lot of money. The city made a lot of money. Made a lot of money. So, when they were drawing the boundaries of the city, they originally proposed to actually have it go all the way, all of San Pablo Avenue, from the southern border to the Berkeley border, was going to be Emeryville. The people in Golden Gate were just incensed. They were like, oh my god, the meat and trails, the fucking cow and trails, blah blah blah, this is crazy. So a compromise was reached, and a border was moved 730 feet to the west, which is currently Vallejo Street, along the Temesco Creek line, which is why you have Oakland, Emeryville, Oakland, Berkeley, when you drive up San Pablo. Yeah. The only reason it existed was to create a buffer zone for the very good people, moral upstanding people of the Golden Gate neighborhood. <laughs> I hope they're happy. <laughs> so, anyways, um, moving on, we got Walter Christie. Walter Christie was the first mayor of Emeryville. He was elected the same day the city became uh, a, uh, the township became a city and was incorporated. He served as the mayor of Emeryville for 40 years. If you ever drive through Emeryville and you would see Christie Avenue or Christie Park, it's named after Walter Christie. He served for 40 years. He was only ever the mayor of Emeryville. He never served as a council member. Um, Walter won most of his votes um, to serve as a, as a council member by being friends with the horse track. So probably a lot like how the city was incorporated, uh, Walter was uh, elected the same way. <laughs> city of Emeryville didn't just have horse racing. It's actually a place of innovation in the world of gambling. It's the Blue Star Amusement Park. Vice was flourishing in Emeryville in the early 1900s, and in 1916, despite having a population of roughly 1,300 people, Emeryville, which at that time was 0.8 square miles, pre peninsula, mind you, we'll get to that, had 22 saloons, one liquor store, a beer garden at the Shell Mountain Park, multiple gambling, gambling establishments, and 20 no brothels. Wow. For 1,300 people. Okay. <laughs> it's my kind of day. <laughs> so it was, reported, it was reported that the city of Emeryville um, was basically a haven and a place for everybody on the West Coast to come to if you basically wanted to get away from morals and Christian values. <laughs> prostitutes were in abundance. Emeryville was reputed to have the best prostitutes in East Bay. Thank you very much. And, <laughs> um, it drew itself a little bit of a reputation. So the Blue Star Amusement Park was the very first Greyhound racing track in the United States. Oh. It was um, put in Emeryville. It was on Park Avenue, located between Holden and Horton Streets. And it has innovation in several ways. Um, a gentleman who, by the name, I'm going to get his name completely wrong. He has like four names. Um, his name is Owen something. We'll find it later. Owen um, Patrick Smith. Owen Smith, I believe. Yeah. Owen Grant Smith, I think. Patrick. Owen Patrick. Owen Patrick. 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 Who said that? Thank right. you very much, Patrick. Thank Patrick. You. Right there on the speaker. Oh. <laughs> Never mind the slide. Uh, yes. So Owen Patrick Smith um, actually was an innovator. So. Greyhound racing had come from England, but England was a brutal place, and they were like, kill the rabbit, eat the rabbit. So the Greyhounds like all the rabbits to death, and people in the United States were like, oh my god, we got Greyhound racing. So um, he was like, I want Greyhound racing, it's making us a lot of money. So he moved all the way from Oklahoma to Emeryville to open a, race, a, a Greyhound race track, and he invented the mechanical rabbit. And the very first mechanical rabbit race happened in Emeryville huh. in 1920, huh. the very first opening day of the Blue Star Amusement Park, and the dog caught the rabbit. <laughs> and newspapers reported that the dog act surprised at the odd and strange configuration of what he thought was a real rabbit. <laughs> um, the, the park was a success. Greyhound racing was ultimately outlawed in the United States. Um, but as you see here, Emeryville was a place to be, despite its small population. On the left, you have um, the racetrack, the jockey club, which also doubled as a place for airline, airplane stunts. So after airplanes came into effect, they used to actually use the racetrack for runways, and airplanes would do stunts there. And on uh, the far right, you'll see um, on the left is John Doyle, who was one of the original council members. On the far right is uh, Walter Christie, the mayor of Emeryville. Yeah. And in the middle is uh, James Grant, who was the owner at the time of the racetrack. So if you wanted to meet your council member, you generally spent your afternoon going to the racetrack to find them, hoping that they had scored on a trifecta. <laughs> so let's move along. Emeryville was more than just horse racing. It was also gambling. It was uh, Chinese lotteries. It was chance. It was all kinds of things. And so Emeryville had a number of different pieces that were going on. Um, I'm just going to explain why my notes are there. 
Um, we have a number of different pieces that were going on, and on the far left you'll see something that might look familiar to a couple of you minus the sign. It's the card club, the Oaks Club. How many of you know how old the Harvest Club is? Yeah. On San Pablo? 124 years old. I just said San Pablo, that wasn't an answer, but that's okay. 124 years old. It opened in 1895 as the Congress Room. Wow. And Jack Congress and, and Harry Tibbetts opened it together. And when Jack Congress left the business, Harry Tibbetts is now in the fourth generation of Tibbetts family ownership. It's the single largest grossing tax revenue source for the city of Beverlyville. It's the oldest, longest serving, and continuous car club in Northern California. Wow. It still exists at the corner of San Pablo where the original building was built. Wow. So, we had eight car clubs at one point. Um, the bottom picture on the right is the Santa Fe Club, which is a popular place to go and have Chinese lotteries where you cast dice for a dime, and uh, everybody in town participated. It was a known place that police authorized and allowed people to openly do in daylight, even though it was completely illegal. <laughs> completely illegal. So, what's going on in the city of Emeryville if it's completely illegal? Well, in 1920, just to set the stage, we had 22 saloons, 14 Chinese lotteries, eight car clubs, all of them were built on Park and San Pablo Avenues, right around Town Hall. Population was about 1,500. So, every good story about Vice needs a villain. And if you're a city of Vice and you have a villain, that means that's a good doing, law enforcement, blah blah blah, I went to church something. So, his name is Earl Warren, he's on the left. Um, so, Earl Warren began his career as an Alameda County District Attorney. And let me just come out and say, the dude fucking hated everybody. He fucking hated us. He's like, this fucking little shithole needs to go away and I have to figure out how. And he spent most of his career trying to obliterate everybody. No, he didn't. Secret, he failed. But That's not true. He tried really, really hard. So in 1920, it was a big year for a dude like Earl Warren because most prohibition was was The prohibition was like, oh no, you can't gamble, you can't drink, you can't do all this shit. All those things are bad and immoral. He was like, yes, let me get my hands on fucking every bill. Well, every bill was exactly how the people in town school feared. We were a wide open city, you could do whatever the hell you wanted. Prostitutes were the best thing. Everything was going right for every bill if you were about every bill. So Warren decided he was going to take us down. And in 1924, he got a grand jury to publish a report that stated, and I quote, Gambling and vice are rampant in Emeryville, and the town's police department should be reorganized to keep them in check. Well, Emeryville ignored that report completely, so in 1927 he sent a group of 75 men that were called Raiders, not to be confused with our book misleading at the time, into the Emeryville establishments. They arrested over 300 patrons, they confiscated gambling machines, they broke windows, they demolished furniture. It was their law enforcement way of like, let me rough them up. Emeryville didn't give a fuck. Emeryville's like, we're still going to rebuild and keep doing this shit. So he tried again in May 1928. But this time he went and he actually took down a brewery during Prohibition that was located on 47th Street. Whose brewery was it? The police chief's. But anyways, <laughs> Ed Carey owned a brewery in his house and the barn next to it on 47th Street. Okay, and JJ Carey, by the way, is on the right. And the only reason his page up here is I think he's fucking hot as hell. But yeah, I'm totally JJ Carey. So uh, he's up there for a reason. But in any event, they came through and they were like, okay, dude, you have $25,000 of illegal beer and liquor here. And they were like, arrest me, I'm the police chief. Oh, there's nobody to arrest me because I'm the police chief. So Warren was very frustrated. He's like, what do I do about these people? So he went to a local media outlet. He got them to publish this thing that said, vice is flourishing in Emeryville under the encouragement of city and, and police officials who are also getting their cut. Within a block of the police station, Emeryville has 12 houses of prostitution and at least 20 bootlegging joints. Mayor Christie, the dignified man that he was, responded, the good people of Emeryville are all about as law-abiding as anybody in any community here. And it seems impossible that they would return to office their local officials for such record-breaking periods had they been unworthy of such consideration. <laughs> Clearly, Mayor Christie was in on the deal, but he wasn't going to say that. He was a very dignified man. So Warren went to the Fed and said, I need your help. So in 1932, the Fed and Warren and the county people all raided the Emeryville Police Department at 3900 Adeline Avenue. Okay, here's the deal. They found the liquor fleet. Let's just be straight up about that. The liquor fleet, which was five, all five of the Emeryville police cars <laughs> had special compartments that contained 565 gallons of food bag liquor. <laughs> all 12 of our police officers were placed under immediate su suspension and investigation. And Chief Carey, with his son, the hot guy, said, I'm shocked. Shocked. That's all he said. Well, Emeryville got lucky because 
because in 1933, Prohibition ended. That's why we're numbered, we'll say, we're like, thank God. So in 1933, Prohibition ended, and Warren shook his fist at the sky and said, I'll get you next time, Batman. But a little side note about Warren before I move on to the next chapter of Riverdale history, which is, if you didn't know, Earl Warren was a governor in California after that. And he actually became the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And he got that role because he was viewed as tough on crime and as a person who tried to close and wrinkle down. And so I want to take credit on behalf of the fair people of my city <laughs> for the fact that Brandon v. Arizona, where your due process rights when you're arrested, yes. Griswold v. Connecticut, where the, the permanent right to privacy was constitutionally enshrined and women were guaranteed the right to make the, the choices for reproduction on their own, mm -hmm. and Brown v. Board of Education, where we did segregated schools, were all written by Earl Warren. And he would have never reached the Supreme Court had he not tried to close under the <laughs> Moving on, Park Avenue has never had a park on it, but it's had a lot of other things. Blue Star Amusement Park, the Jockey Club. It also was the home of the Oakland Oaks, which was a minor league baseball team, Pacific Coast League, 1912 to 1955. Nothing to see here, folks. Okay, so let's move on to Al Lacoste, Sec section two of my four sections, which is Al Lacoste, who was the mayor after Mayor Christie. Mayor Christie was there for 40 years. Al Lacoste served 40 years in the council, 26 years as mayor. Al Lacoste was the first of two Lacoste that we're going to talk about tonight. He's a pretty prickly guy. Al Lacoste, um, as gambling started to fade away, people in Reno were like looking at us like we're going to take you down, bitches. And so people in Emeryville started to kind of close down and move around. The city became a little more transparent in the 1950s, but not for a good reason. Um, the guy in the bottom of the picture on the left side is named George Goodman. He was elected to the city council in 1952. George Goodman went to a couple council meetings, and he came out to the public one day and said, this is bullshit. He's like, they have secret meetings. I want the minutes of the secret meetings reported in the minutes at the council meeting. And Mayor Lacoste, missing the point, said, we've had those secret meetings for 16 years, we've never done minutes, I'm not going to start today. Every <laughs> <laughs> was doing its backdoor deals on a different night, outside of the view of the public, and nobody had even known. But Mayor Lacoste was willing to defend the status quo, and you know what? He had a lot of clout to do so. In 1954, Goodman resigned, but he didn't go away. He said, fuck you, Al Lacoste, I'm going to fuck you until you're fucking gone. So he's like, I've come to every city council meeting, I say everything I need to say, I'm going to take you down, Al Lacoste. And you know what? They had this bitter fight, and it's like, if I had an hour to tell you, I'd tell you about the drama. But they don't. So just imagine, just like, ah. So, in 1961, George Goodman shows up, and he's like, ah, 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 ah. He's like, recall, bitch. And so, he throws like a recall petition down, and 100 people are like, oh yeah, what you going to do now, Al? And he's like, fucking fight you. And so he did. He punched George Goodman in the face. Um, and he came down from his chair, he punched George Goodman in the face, there was a lot of drama, John's kids got involved, the police were holding people back, it was like, don't punch me, bro. So um, this whole thing happened, and George Goodman like ate it up. He's like, I'm going to get rid of Val Lacoste, the political machine of every building. He's been here forever, he's old, and he's a political mob boss, and he's running this gambling racket. I'm going to get rid of him. Well, uh, it takes a little more than promising to do that, George. So I'm going to skip a lot of the story about the, uh, the, the, the efforts to recall Mr. Lacoste and how it got there. But let's just, uh, let's just put it this way. In the end, there was an election in September of 1961. And Al Lacoste squeaked by. He did not get recalled. He found enough people to go door to door for him, even though police had to guard his friends because they were getting death threats. There's a whole ton of stories about that. He didn't get recalled. But, so what happened? As soon as he found out he didn't get recalled. Yeah, there he is, he didn't get recalled. Wow. Right. He set all the rules. He's like, you know what? I don't like public engagement so much. <laughs> George Goodman is an asshole, and I want him out of my life. So, on the day after he beat the recall, the day after, he goes to the city council and goes, here's the new rules. And so what are the new rules? Well, the new rules are pretty simple. You must submit a public comment that's only, quote, of a constructive nature. Such public comment must be, quote, submitted in writing. It must be reviewed, quote, 2 p.m. on the Thursday of the week preceding the meeting. Quote, it must be approved by the mayor. Quote, personal attacks upon council members or city employees will never be allowed. So he basically was like, bye, George Goodman. Goodbye. Well, do you think George Goodman took that? No, George Goodman did not take that. George Goodman was like, no, I'm going to do a recount. I'm going to recount this bullshit because this is not the way government is supposed to be run. So he went to the county a couple days later and he said, I want a recount. The county is like, okay, we'll do a recount. So they call the city clerk in Emeryville. Um, my bad, we burned all the ballots. Oh! 
Yeah. A guy named William C. Okay, this dude is 79 fucking years old. He's like a hero. He's 79 years old. He is the oldest and longest serving city clerk in the history of California. He had served since 1915. The dude was like, Wow. Like, I burned the ballots. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you did. But like, you could barely walk. So he basically confessed that it was a grave and a horrendous mistake. That's what he said. But he happened to take all the ballots from the recall election, along with, quote, some rubbish. Like, like he's from fucking 1800s Britain. Some rubbish to the every high school incinerator. And accidentally incinerated them. So a lawsuit ensued. George Gunner was like, that is crazy. That's not legal, and I'm going to finally get my name out of cost. And the, you know what the Supreme Court said? They were like, uh, yeah, so there's a loophole in the law that says you only have to keep the ballots for all these elections, but it doesn't have a rule about recall elections. So. Oh. Oh. So, how would Ross remain the mayor? Oh. George Goodman remained on the outside. But, you know what? George Goodman thought, I'm going to see my day, because what's going to happen? I have this trial he is doing it yeah, about being punched in the face. So, a month after, about two months, not even, after this recall election, the mayor of Emeryville sat on trial for battery. This is not an uncommon thing in Emeryville, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's not an uncommon thing. He sat on trial for battery, and two council members testified for George Goodman that, oh yeah, the mayor like came down and he was like, clock. And two council members were like, one said, oh, it was more of a pad? And the other was like, I kind of felt like it was a punch. <laughs> two hours, five minutes later, the jury was like, guilty of battery. Well, the judge was from Emeryville. <laughs> so he asked Mayor Lacoste, from the dais, would you rather pay a $25 fine or spend two days in jail? And Alacost was like, I'll pay. And so he paid twenty five dollars and he never went to jail and he remained the mayor of memory. So I'm gonna fast forward through a couple things here that happened. Um, those two guys that testified against uh, Mayor Lacoste, they were up for election next year, so Mayor Lacoste wasn't really having them. So he ran some people against him, and guess what? There was three seats. The two people Mayor Lacoste, Lacoste ran won the two seats, and those other two people, fate be told, they tied. They tied for third. Four hundred and twenty eight votes each. And they were like, fuck. They're like, let's do a recount, maybe we can beat somebody. And you know what, they both lost one vote, and they tied. They tied for 427 votes. And so guess what? In every vote, what do we do? Well, we fucking gamble. So we roll dice. So the city attorney's like, well, you have to actually have a dice game to decide what should be selected in the city council. And they were like, what the shit, this is my ally. They're like, that's your choice. So they went to the court, went all the way up in the courts. So the courts were like, dice are legal in every vote. Roll the dice. They refused to roll the dice. So the city attorney of the city of Emeryville rolled one dice for one guy and one dice for one guy. And Fred Fraga beat Carl Crawford on a roll of six to five. And he became a city council. <laughs> End of that story. Oh. So after Al Lacrosse, he left office in 1964. He actually got beaten, believe it or not, after 40 years. He left office, and these council members were so excited. They're like, oh, the mob boss is gone. We need a new image. It's a new day in Emeryville. It's a new day. And so this is like totally, I imagine it being like like rosy cheeks and like butterflies around him. This council member named Donald Neary, he was like, well, you know what? We need a new image. Let's come up with a great city seal. Let's incorporate something which would give the city prestige. Well, you're we so hopeful, Donald. Um, so that's what a good seals look like. You know, the seal of San Francisco on the top, the seal of Los Angeles on the bottom. They have all kinds of distinguished appearance. Whatever. Okay, fuck that. That's Emeryville. Okay. <laughs> fucking Neary came up with, right? And for a long time, I have represented the city, and I'm like, this is what happens when Clip Art fucks an Atari. Okay? I'm like, this is literally the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen, and this is the deal. So I signed a letter as mayor with the mayors of San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, and Los Angeles last year, and it was like, distinguish shield, distinguish shield, distinguish shield, what is that thing at the end of the letter? I can't do shit, what is this? So, and actually I learned that it actually has some significance and meaning. Those four symbols are supposed to be, quote, stylized E's to represent Emeryville. Oh. And they come together, as the four freeways do in Emeryville, for the Bay Bridge, the 80, the 580, and the 880. And together in the middle, it is an interchange. The fucking center of our logo is an interchange. I cannot stress how angry I am as a transit and active transit advocate that the fucking center of it is an interchange. So, economic prosperity and environmental health, and the blue is supposed to be the sky in the bay. Whatever. We're gonna move on. Okay, so I've been told that this is the 1966 general plan. 
it basically looks like, oh, we're kind of greedy and we don't like water. Um, so the city of Emeryville attempted to double its size by filling in the entire bay. And I have to speak through this part of it because I want to get to the good stuff at the end. So the city tried to double the entire size of the bay, okay? They planned an expansion. It had 10 office towers, 1,800 residential units, all this crap, okay? The city was just started filling the bay. We just started filling the bay. Then the city was like, no, 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 no. We're going to create this thing called BCDC to stop Emeryville, and you cannot fill the bay anymore. There's a lot of lawsuits, and bottom line is the city was basically told, stop filling the bay. So the city was like, oh, we only did but one half the plan. They're like, yeah, but we'll let you build a giant Aztec pyramid hotel at the end of it if you stop. <laughs> so, we got a giant Aztec pyramid that never got built. I'm very upset about that. It's going on right now. It has living restaurants and everything. <laughs> Anyways, we were supposed to have that, okay? Didn't happen. So there it is, it's a picture of the baby being built. So in the end, um, there was a guy named Edward Stefani, and Edward Stefani um, was a city engineer, and he basically said, okay, here's the deal. Hey, BCDC, we get that you're the boss. We're sorry we're such bad assholes. So we kind of just built this like stick, and we just want like a little bit of a curve. We just need the tip. You know how that goes, right? <laughs> so, we just need the tip because we need a little bit of a marina harbor. And they're all like, oh, all right, all right, you're going to have some acres of the tip. So it's like this little bit we're supposed to get, okay? After they surveyed it, they're like, bitch, you built 1,800 feet and 12 and a half acres. That's way more than we said you could do. So BCDC came to City Hall and they're like, we want to see the city engineer. And you might remember, the city engineer built that general plan that was supposed to build the whole thing. That was like his dream project, probably. Okay? So they're like, we want to see him. They're like, um, he's on vacation. We don't know when he's coming back. And they're generally in that story. They're like, we don't know when he's coming back. So City of Emeryville is just it's the only city in the history of the Bay that has illegally filled the Bay. There you go. All right. Um, Random slide, did you know that Emeryville had a heliport? I didn't know that was kind of fun, I wanted to show you. The Emeryville Municipal Heliport existed in the 1970s on the peninsula before the current uh, Tanium building existed. Okay, bye. Um, so, uh, wrapping up here, let's see. Emeryville, okay, it's a new format. Yeah, we had a city a city government where we decided we're gonna actually have a city manager, we're the only city in the county that didn't have a city manager. We're gonna hire a city manager, this guy looks like he's a nice guy, I can tell you a lot of nice things about him. He was a professional, okay? They were like, oh, we're so excited to have him, and then eight months later, they're like, we hate him, we're gonna get rid of him. No city managers in Emeryville. So we abolished the city manager, ask me on the side, I'll tell you all about that story, I'll tell you another time. Um, <laughs> Emeryville tries to get itself together. That's like a great headline in the newspaper. It's like, this is my town, and I'm happy that it tried really hard, and it failed for a long time. Uh, the crazy thing was there was those people, who remember the Golden Gate folks? Uh -huh. They like wanted to get annexed by us. It's like, I look back and I'm like, were you on crap? Like, what were you thinking? They're like, oh no, we were the Golden Gate people back in the 1800s, but now we kind of like your town, even though it's corrupt and crazy and all this other shit. You have a lot of money and good schools, and so, can we be annexed by you? So we were going to annex North Oakland. People always say to me in North Oakland, will you annex us? And I'm always like, oh yeah, in 1978, you offered that and your mayor said no. So Lionel Wilson actually vetoed uh, Emeryville annexing the rest of what was Golden Gate from the original period of 1978. Okay, so I'm supposed to wrap up. Uh, I don't have time to tell you the story of John Lacoste, which is actually, I, I got as far as I could get. It's the last story I can tell, but I don't have time. So. Oh, Come to the next show. <laughs> Come up here and ask the story about John Lacoste. But let me just put it in a nutshell. John Lacoste was so Lacoste was the son of Al Lacoste. He was the police chief in 1974. Right. He for 10 years served as the political boss of Emeryville. He ran a prostitution ring out of the back of the townhouse, go there for fine dining dinner, never mind the fact that prostitutes used to be there. And he did a bunch of other things like take tons of bribes. He gave council members in the late 70s and early 80s free apartments and condos in Emeryville. Like there's an entire story. I could do an hour presentation on John Lacoste. In any event, um, his whole regime and the political corruption of Emeryville was about to crack in 1984 when the last two people who he needed on council to prevent him from being fired were up for recall. And I just want to play one council member's response to KQED's investigative reporting asking him, did you or did you not threaten some business owners to advertise in support of your campaign? But we were able to get an interview with council member Golden. What is your connection to the Eagle, to the newspaper? I have no connection to it. You have none whatsoever? None whatsoever, no. Do you, um, I mean, are you, you're not on, you're not an advisor of any sort? No. Okay. I'm wondering, we, we recently talked to a, a person that you know, a guy named Leo Macias. I know Leo, yes. He's, he's a businessman here in town. Okay. And Leo advised us that you were in his office and that you, um, 
actually told him and pressured him. <laughs> I, to no, take I'm, on I'm sorry. That's that's just not true. Lee and I have known each other for a long time, and we were kidding around. That's all we were doing. There was absolutely no pressure. Leo indicated that he was going to stay neutral in the upcoming election, and I told him that was just fine with me. And if he intimated anything else, it's just not true. You didn't in any way pressure him? No. Okay. It's, maybe you could answer this. Has anybody else in, in, involved with Eagle, to your knowledge, pressured Leo Macias? Uh, I don't think so. Can we stop for a <laughs> Yeah, in 1984, Jim Golden was recalled by a very large margin. Um, so I'm going to finish here, um, and you can ask me questions about it. But basically, in 1984, the Lacoste regime that had run the city of Emeryville for decades uh, fell. Everybody was like, yes, it's overall. And by the way, it was three women who ran that rant call, and it's women who defeated the corruption of the <laughs> And so, you know, the happy ending, the cost is gone. Oh yeah, not quite, he ran for city council. Um, but he lost, both in 1985 and 1987, and as my parting blow to him, I would just let you know that he filed for bankruptcy, and one of the claims in his bankruptcy was an unpaid $21,000 bar bar tab from the townhouse, where he had held a court. So, uh, John Lacoste left, the end.